The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. All these voices. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr., and with me, as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? I am doing pretty good. How is everybody tonight? Tonight's article comes from SouthCoastToday.com, and the title is "What Is the Bridgewater Triangle Anyway?" A look at the dark and paranormal tales of this window area of unexplained occurrences. This article was written by Susanna Sudborough from the Towton Gazette, and it was posted October 11th, 2020. Towton, the ghost stories, personal accounts, and folklore that make up the legend of the Bridgewater Triangle are too vast to ever fit in a single book. Though many devoted investigators of the Triangle have tried meticulously to record them, they encompass what can only be described as a smorgasbord of the paranormal, cryptozoological, and just plain weird. In fact, one of the most baffling parts of the Triangle legends has to be the range of strange sightings said to be a part of this enigmatic approximately 200 square mile area of the Bay State. Anything that you want to be in the Triangle is in the Triangle. It's a Pandora's box, said folklorist and author of several books on the Bridgewater Triangle Chris Balzano. So you're into zombies. There are stories about zombies. If you're into Bigfoot, he's there. If you're into Puckwudgies, that's kind of Puckwudgie Central. If you're into ghosts, you got it. UFOs, black helicopters, it's there. And one need not believe in the supernatural to enjoy the mystery and history of it all. Aaron Cadu, co-creator of a 2013 documentary on the Bridgewater Triangle, said that while he's a born skeptic, he loved collecting creepy stories about the Triangle be just because of the fun of it. I walked into the project probably like 99% skeptic and walked out of the project still like a 96, he said. But there were a few things in the film that even me as a skeptic kind of had to take a step back and scratch my head. The modern cultural origin of the Bridgewater Triangle legend is widely thought to lie within cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman's 1983 book, Mysterious America. In it, he coined the term Bridgewater Triangle, inspired, of course, by the Bermuda Triangle, established its rough boundaries, and identified some of the Triangle's most notable places and legends, calling it a window area of unexplained occurrences. Coleman establishes Rehoboth in the southwest, Abington in the north and Freetown in the southeast as the three points of the triangle, meaning hundreds of thousands of people in Towton, Brockton, Rainham, Berkeley, Dington, Easton, Norton, Mansfield, and the Bridgewaters live inside of it. But modern investigators into the triangle insist that there is by no means a clear boundary for the haunted and strange area often pointing to Fall River parts of Rhode Island, nearby towns, and even Cape Cod as being under the Triangle's unique influence. No one ever said there's a line on the road, and if you're on one side of it, you're fine, and outside the Triangle, and on the other side of it, you're in it, said author and paranormal investigator Jeff Ballinger. It bleeds out. Coleman wrote about the infamous Hockamock Swamp, located between Easton and West Bridgewater, as being known for its sighting of spook lights, unexplained balls of light floating around, as well as large hairy creatures often thought to be Bigfoot himself. He has also penned some of the most famous Bridgewater Triangle stories, how two WHD radio reporters from Boston saw a home plate shaped UFO 
with red lights and a front headlight in West Bridgewater in 1979, and how in 1971, Norton Police Sergeant Thomas Downey spotted a gigantic winged creature while driving home through Easton one night and reported it to Easton Police, much to his ridicule. But the stories go far beyond what Coleman captured in his book. The mysterious Dington Rock, with its strange writings, is often included. Anawan Rock in Rehoboth, Lake Nippinicket in Bridgewater, and Profile Rock in Freetown are hot spots for sightings of phantom campfires and ghosts of Native Americans. Also notable for paranormal sightings are Solitude Stone, the Raymond Taunton Dog Track, several cemeteries in Rehoboth, King Philip's Cave in Norton, and the Hornbine School and Shad Factory in Rehoboth. One of the eeriest legends has to be the red-headed hitchhiker of Route 44. It is said that a man with a big ginger beard and plaid flannel shirt and jeans is often seen on the side of the road near the Rehoboth Seekonk town line. He is said to get into cars only to disappear. And then there's the Freetown State Forest, which has perhaps the darkest reputation of them all. There's Assinet Ledge, the site of many suicides, and where people who have never considered suicide are said to get the sudden urge to jump. But much of this is apparently due to its ties to horrifying true crime stories. Retired Freetown Detective Sergeant Alan Alvis said he witnessed evidence of regular satanic cult activity in the forest for 15 to 20 years, beginning in the late 1970s and continuing into the early 90s. He said he and other officers would regularly find animals that appeared to be sacrificed ritualistically, with no blood in the animal, but none on the scene either. They'd often find satanic graffiti of upside down crosses and pentagrams. Alvis said, police believed the infamous Fall River cult murderers, Carl Drew and Robin Murphy, conducted rituals in the forest, even having a hut in the middle. Alvis also said police found an underground bunker with creepy dolls believed to belong to a satanic couple who were prosecuted for molesting children they had adopted. Alvis was the first officer on scene at the discovery of 15-year-old Mary Lou Aruda of Rainman's body after she was kidnapped in 1978 and found dead in the forest two months later, tied to a tree. That stayed with me because at the time my daughter was just a few years younger, Alvis said. It really stood with me and it stays with me today. Since Coleman's introduction of the Bridgewater Triangle to the world, a select group of paranormal investigators and enthusiasts have stepped up to record and investigate as many strange occurrences as possible, and in doing so, continue the story of the Triangle. Most have their own websites devoted to their findings in the Triangle, but none have any definitive answers as to what is going on there. It's trying to solve a mystery that doesn't want to be solved, Balzano said. You're never going to find the answer, but you're going to find a lot of clues. So what is going on in the Bridgewater Triangle? There is, of course, what perhaps most skeptics believe. Is it because the region has been defined as strange that people are automatically attributing things that could be easily explained as paranormal because there's a heightened sense of awareness living here? Kadu asked. In other words, you hear something crashing in the woods, and it could be a deer, but everyone's minds go to Bigfoot because they're living in the Bridgewater Triangle. But others who have dedicated their time to investigating the Triangle are convinced there is something more going on. Bellinger believes it goes back to King Philip's War, a war between the English settlers and the Native Americans in the mid-1670s. The bloodiest war per capita in U.S. history, it took place largely in the Bridgewater Triangle region and ended up with the Wampanoag chief of Medicom, also known as King Philip, being hung, beheaded, drawn and quartered, and his head displayed on a pike for 200 years at Plymouth Colony. You've probably heard the trope of the unfinished business. The unfinished business really has nothing to do with the dead. It has everything to do with the living, Bellinger said. We don't like people getting away with murder, even if it happened a long time ago. So there's this nagging feeling that happened in this area. But many other Triangle investigators believe King Philip's War is merely a symptom of the negative energy there, and that his mysteriousness is much older. 
having something to do with the land and possibly even being conscious. There are these areas all over the globe that are nicknamed window areas, said Andrew Lake of Greenville Paranormal Research. There are these locations that seem to be like a tear in the veil to other realities. It's a thing. It's not a location. It's not a random place on a map, Balzano said. It's a living, breathing thing that has a hunger and has a dark side to it. But whatever you believe, the Bridgewater Triangle is just a step out the door for anyone living in southeastern Massachusetts. And when you see something strange, you just might wonder if it was something more than it seemed. And that is the end of this article. So this was an interesting article. To me, this seems like this is one of those hot spots that we talk about a lot on this show. Uh, another one is up in Canic Chase. You've heard us talk about that before. The Bridgewater Triangle seems like the same kind of deal where you have a little bit of everything going on there. You got UFOs, you got Bigfoot, you've got uh, suicide ledge, you've got ghosts. You, I mean, there's just everything. So I think that this qualifies as like one of the hot spots. Now, the first thing I want to talk about in this is the Asinet Ledge. Now, the reason I can remember the name of the Asinet Ledge is kind of funny. I, I do a thing when I'm trying to remember something where I use like little triggers where I'll do like, like what does the word sound like or what does the word remind me of, those kind of things. And the Asinet Ledge is a place where when you go there, you have the overwhelming urge to jump off and kill yourself, even if you're not suicidal. If you've never had suicidal thoughts and you've never had the urge to do any harm to yourself, what they say is when you go to that ledge, you have the desire to jump off. So it's called the Asinet Ledge, and the way I remember it is that your ass is going to need a net if you go to that ledge. That's how I remember that it's called the Asinet Ledge. But that reminds me of the suicide forest over in Japan. And that got my wheels turning. Because I always wondered what is causing people to go into that forest and want to kill themselves. And I had the same thought about this ledge. What is making people go there and want to jump off and kill themselves? Now, in the forest, the normal theory, like the most popular theory, is that it's haunted and that the ghosts are influencing you to kill yourself. Now, you do have ghosts here in this Bridgewater Triangle as well. But the idea that it's a hot spot makes me think that maybe the suicide forest over in Japan is also a hot spot. Now, I want to talk a little bit about hot spots and about the, the overarching theory that I have for what they are and why they exist. Now to do this, I'm going to be getting into some astrophysics, but I promise you that I will not let it get too heady. I won't get too technical and, and use too much jargon that most normal people aren't gonna understand. But in astrophysics, there's a thing called a wormhole. I'm pretty sure that everybody has heard that term before, or most people at least have. A wormhole is used in the majority of theories as a point to travel from point A to point B in space. So say you want to go from our solar system to another solar system on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, you could not realistically travel that distance because it would be hundreds of thousands of light years away. And we can't go that speed anyway. So there's no way you would survive that trip. You would be dead long before you ever arrived. But the theory of a wormhole states that you can use that as a doorway, a portal, to where when you enter into the wormhole here, you exit out almost instantaneously on the other side of the universe or the other side of the galaxy or wherever the wormhole links up to. A good way to think about this is 
like the whole beam me up thing from Star Trek. The point where you get beamed from, so wherever you are where they beam you up from, will be point A. And the transporter room where Scotty is standing there, cussing in, in his nice little accent, will be point B. So wormholes, in theory, are kind of the same way. There's two separate ones that are linked. So when you enter the first one, you come out of the second one. It's like a doorway. It's like you're walking through a doorway. But instead of being the space of a foot or two, it's hundreds of thousands of light years away. So here's my theory. There are many different what I call hotspots in the world where there's way more paranormal activity than at other places. The activity is more plentiful, it is more diverse, and it is much stronger there. There are multiple spots around the around the planet that are like this. I think that the suicide forest might be one as well. And the way I'm starting to look at this is not as isolated hotspots, but more like a network of portals, just like wormholes. But instead of being portals or wormholes for us to travel through, they are portals or wormholes for spirits to travel through. So the same way we might enter a wormhole and come out on the other side of the galaxy, these are interdimensional wormholes. Or if you subscribe to the multiverse theory, interuniversal wormholes. To where these entities, these creatures, these ghosts, these spirits, whatever it is, can travel through these portals from wherever they're from to our world. Now, I'm not saying that Bigfoot is an alien when I say this. I believe Bigfoot is Gigantopithecus. We've talked about that on the show before. But what I'm saying is ghosts and spirits are not visible all the time. They appear and they disappear. Where do they go when they disappear? That's kind of a question nobody ever answers. I think that when they disappear, they go back to whatever realm, dimension, universe, whatever you want to say, that they reside in, the afterlife, wherever that is. I don't think it's a separate universe. I think it's more like a separate dimension that is alongside of ours. It's a mirror dimension that is with us at all times. Everything's the same, but it's separated by what we call the veil, which separates our dimension from their dimension. I think when you die, you cross over that veil into this other world where you still exist. and sometimes you can cross back over into this world in a spiritual sense and act upon things in this world. I think that would explain what ghosts are and, and how they operate, why you don't see them all the time. Because if it was just that when you die, your spirit hangs out and, and stays around for a while, where, where does it go? Why can't we see it? How come sometimes it appears and sometimes it doesn't? Now, I've heard the theory that it, it requires a vast amount of energy for a ghost to manifest. Okay, I buy that. There's definitely something to that theory because when you have paranormal activity taking place, you see batteries drained, you see electric equipment drained of power. So that makes sense to me. But where are they? 
are they there and just invisible and you can't see them? Well, if that's the case, then how come when the ghost appears, there's all kinds of other changes to the environment besides just you seeing them? The hair will stand up on your arm. There will be a noticeable and measurable temperature drop. Now, if ghosts were around all the time, there wouldn't be a temperature drop when they manifest. That temperature drop would remain. So there's a lot of unanswered questions there. So I think that they reside in the spiritual realm, the spiritual dimension, which is beside ours in the afterlife, whichever term you're comfortable with, they're really interchangeable, it doesn't matter. And I think they cross over to our plane of existence on occasion. And that's when you have the temperature fluctuations, that's when you have the EMF spikes, that's when you have the hair standing up and you have the manifestation, either auditory with sounds, being able to speak to us, on a spirit box or knocking or whatever, or you have the actual manifestation of an apparition. But how do they cross over? Now we know at these hot spots, what my theory is, is that in these spots, it's much easier to make that journey across. That's why you have way more activity because that barrier that separates our two planes of existence is thinner there. But how about the places where it's not thinner? How do they cross over? Well, to get the answer to that actually requires a great deal of research and study. And fortunately for you, your absolute favorite host in the world is a big nerd that loves to research and study. If you guys remember the episode that I did on Bloody Mary here on the show. We got into talking about mirror magic. And I went through all the different legends from ancient Rome, ancient Greece, all the different civilizations and their beliefs on mirror magic. And my theory in that show that I started talking about kind of sinks in with this. Because in that show, I talked about how I believe that mirrors are being utilized as a portal of sorts. I, I think the actual way I described it on that episode was it's like exits on an interstate to where they can get off at whatever exit they want. So could it be that mirrors are one of the portal ways to this other dimension. Could it be that ghosts and spirits are using mirrors to cross from their dimension, their plane of existence, into ours? A lot of ancient people thought so. A lot of the mythologies, a lot of the legends talk about mirrors being portals and being passageways to another spiritual realm. That's why we have all of the little wives tales and, and superstitions about mirrors to where if you break one, you get so many years of bad luck. That belief comes from ancient Rome where they talk about how they believe that a mirror would actually capture part of your essence, part of your soul. And by breaking the mirror, you're actually shattering a piece of your own soul. That is why it takes seven years of bad luck to get back, because it takes seven years for the soul to repair itself, seven being a holy number. All of this stuff ties in together. It's absolutely fascinating. So if mirrors are in fact portals, 
that spiritual entities can use whether they are ghosts or whether they're demonic entities, whatever, can use to cross into our realm of existence. What about places that don't have mirrors? Such as this forest in Japan. I'm pretty sure that out in the suicide forest, there's not a bunch of mirrors hanging everywhere. So how do the the ghost or whatever kind of entities are in that forest that are causing these people to want to hurt themselves. How are they getting through? How are they influencing these people? Well, you have to ask yourself, what is a mirror? What constitutes a mirror? When reality, a mirror can be any reflective surface, correct? Anything that will reflect your image back to you could be considered a mirror. So in that line of thinking, any pond, any lake, any body of water, any river, any creek, even a mud puddle could serve the same function, possibly. So that's very interesting to think about. That if... This is how they travel. And when you're not picking up anything, it's because they're not here right now. But when they cross over from their realm, you know that they do that. Because there are, there are things that happen in our physical world that can document it. You have EMS spikes, you have temperature drops, you have manifestations. You have animals act really weird when a ghost is around, even if you can't see them yet. They know when they're there, they stare off at nothing in the corner, they take off running, they know what's going on. They have a, a, a more sensitive awareness than we do, I think. But it's very, very interesting. So I'm thinking that this Asinet ledge Whatever is causing people to want to kill themselves there, I think it's the same kind of thing that's happening in that suicide forest over in Japan. Whatever entity is, is causing people to feel that way, I think could, could be in both places. And I don't think it's a single ghost. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying whatever it is that is causing that behavior. So then we have to ask ourselves, do we think that it is a specific type of entity, like a shadow person or a wraith or a ghost, or what do we believe it is that is causing this to happen? Do we believe that it is anything at all that's causing that to happen? Is it possible that extremely high levels of EMF could cause suicidal tendencies? Well, we know that high levels of EMF can cause different physical reactions in people. They can cause headaches. They can cause people to get sick. They can also cause people that are mentally ill to be triggered and to have much more severe and much more often episodes in their mental illness. They trigger addiction. There's a lot of physical changes that take place when you have high levels of EMF. Now, you can get high levels of EMF without spiritual activity. If you're too close to a power line, it will put off a, a hell of a lot of EMF. So it's not necessarily just ghosts that do this. But if we know that high levels of EMF can cause physical changes and mental changes in the human body and the human psyche. Is it possible that it is extremely high levels of EMF that are causing people to want to jump off that ledge and people to want to kill themselves 
at a certain point in that forest in Japan? I would say yes. That is a very good possibility. I think it's actually fairly likely that that is the cause. So the next logical question we have to ask ourselves would be, what would cause that, that level of EMF? Because it can't be just a particular entity that's causing that level of EMF because that entity is not going to be in that exact location all the time. I would submit to you, my theory, is that Asinet Ledge and the suicide forest in Japan, in that suicide forest in Japan, there is a spot, much like Asinet Ledge in the Bridgewater Triangle, an origin point where the veil is thinner than at any other point in that hotspot. I think that is the point. I think in Bridgewater Triangle, it's Asinet Ledge. I think that is the point where it's the thinnest section of the veil, the barrier, whatever separates our dimension from theirs. So I think you're getting a high level of bleed over in that spot. That's why there will be such high EMF spikes in that spot. That's why people are being affected mentally in that spot because that is where the veil is thinnest. So that is where the highest concentration of spiritual energy from that other realm will be. So if that is correct, if my whole theory is correct, then that solves the mystery of the Asinet Ledge. And it would also solve the mystery of the suicide forest in Japan. Now, I'm not saying that I'm 100% correct. What I am saying is it makes sense. It fits. It all adds up together. And I think it's extremely interesting. So I want to throw over to Old Boy, and I want to get his opinion on my theory, and also get his opinion on the hot spots and the suicide forest and just the whole the whole kit and caboodle that we've talked about. So old boy, go ahead, brother. Thank you, brother. Um this one's an interesting one. The Bridgewater Triangle. Another sounds like another can can of chase, kind of like be Bermuda Triangle kind of thing. I kind of agree with James, but I have a little bit a difference of opinion of these places you're talking about: the Japanese forest, suicide forest in Japan, and uh, I forget what was it, the ridge, where they're saying it makes people want to kill themselves. I have a little theory about that. We'll get into that in a minute. What I think is, this is a theory that I have. They're saying people are killing themselves. Well, think about it. They're saying that there might be a, a very another dimension or a very thin veil like he was talking about. Or is there a curse that people who, something has bad happened in those areas and they're cursed to people go there and stuff happens. I would think maybe with the ridge, maybe not. Or maybe these ghosts are making people kill themselves to get themselves to come in. I, I always had this theory. Maybe if you guys watch the skeleton key, like a ghost taking over a human body, this is a little bit different theory. -o. Maybe why it gets people to kill themselves is so they can come over from the another dimension. Another say another person part of you comes over, like he was saying, you're in another dimension, or it's something else comes through. It got you to kill itself so it could come over here, kill yourself. Sorry, and got got to come over itself for every person that kills or gets to kill themselves 
another ghost comes over or entity or another dimension creature, whatever they are, come over. Because it's very interesting what happens in Japan. People go there and like it's famous. You'll you'll see people hanging or you'll see people's shoes because they do the shoes thing where they'll throw the shoes and you'll know that's where somebody has died. Because, I mean, there's a lot of people have killed themselves in that forest. It's been going on for a long time. And I think there's there's certain parts in this world that are more attuned than others. Like like in Wisconsin, you know, you'll see Bigfoot, zombies, werewolves, vampires, just like uh, uh, the triangle there. Vampires, werewolves, Bigfoot. You have ridges where you kill yourself. Can chase, same thing. A bunch of stuff going on. Well, what I think is some of these areas, is like James said, they're very attuned to something else. A lot of activity goes on there. Paranormal, crypto, it's all kind, all within alien activity. And I think these are just hot spots like he was talking about. And they have some kind of energy there. There's just something that's stronger there than it is anywhere else. Just like the Nevada desert. It, it's just a hot spot for aliens and weird creatures and stuff. But I think now with that, with a killing, having, making you kill, if you, think about this, guys. If I wanted to come over as a ghost, I can capture somebody to kill themselves. Or maybe it's a ghost that it's, it, it's a demon who gets you to kill. That's how he does his sacrifice. Think about it. I, I, I get you to jump off a cliff. Or kill yourself in a forest, a Japanese demon. You never know. Think about it. Or it's a, it's a, it's a ghost that gets you to do it. Maybe the ghost there, the lost souls there. Because there's supposed to be lost souls and, the, and all kinds of things. Um, I forgot that one weird the Japanese demon we did, did it show about. I might have you come in. Remember that demon, James? I forgot what the name was. Well, whatever that, that creature could make you, you know, would eat you. Or if you threw it a cucumber, leave you alone. But that was a Japanese demon. But maybe something there, get these, these lost goal, souls make you kill yourself. It's different than that ridge because that's just one area. That forest is all like miles long and people have killed themselves. And they still go there and kill themselves knowing there's people who have done it. Maybe it's another gateway. Maybe it's an offering for the demons. You never know. Think about it. A demon can make you do something. You know, all of a sudden you go out of nowhere and you jump off a cliff. Come on, man. Think about that. Or it could be a veil to another side of dimension. Like James said, a thin thin veil of that side. Thin, very thin. And I'm probably killing words right now. I'm sorry, guys. You know how I am. I'm old boy. You know, I, it's, I, I've, I have a speech impairment. I've worked with it for a long time. So just so you guys know in the future. I've always had problems saying certain words, and that's it's hard for me. <laughs> hey, old boy, it's the Kappa. Yeah. The Kappa. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. The, the, the Kappa. We did a show years ago. Check it out, guys, about that. But what I'm thinking is maybe it's a spirit that gets people to kill themselves or a demon, especially that ridge. That whole area is a hot spot anyway. So I'm thinking about that, and that's what I want to throw because, you know, James, I always throw curveballs. I just threw another curveball. It could be a demon telling people to kill themselves, and that's how it gets a sacrifice. Just like the one now, the thing jumping off the ridge, I think that's different. I think maybe that's just something there. Or maybe it's something, another dimension, like you're not supposed to be there and you crossed over, and that's why you jump over and kill yourself. But on the maybe it takes you to the other dimension after you die. You know, if you ever think about that. It goes to another dimension. You go to your other soul or whatever you are on the other side as just a different person. So you never know. That's what I'm just throwing out here. Now, all this other stuff, Bigfoot, it could be, man. I mean, there's there's all kinds of weird stuff going over here at this triangle thing. It's kind of funny. It's another triangle like the Bermuda. That's more of st things just disappear, time travel, aliens. Never really any Bigfoot because it's a lot of water and stuff. Sea monsters, stuff like that. But this place is a little bit different. I think it's different. I think there's different parts that open up that are pure disaster. And I think this is just where, if what he's talking about is just pure evil is there. And it just, stuff happens. Maybe evil so powerful. You think about this, guys. 
maybe the presence of evil is so powerful it can make you kill them kill yourself over with i'm not talking about or uh not talking about like the, maybe it's just such a, a evil presence it could kill you it doesn't even need to take kill you do much it just gets you to kill itself kill yourself and like with the suicide force maybe the sadness is so strong like a sadness like you ever had a sadness it overtakes you and the sadness has become a thing like the nothing it's like just like evil just come its own entity and it makes you do something like kill yourself and you're already some people go there they already have problems and stuff and it just overwhelms them and kills them with sadness and maybe with all the grief and everything it's just this fill of sadness is there I get it when I go to Hollywood. There's like a real fill of sadness. You can feel the sadness in the air. Because a lot of people have lost their souls and lost their dreams. And a lot of people have died there. And I think that might be what's going on. Like a sadness of real, a lot of stuff might have been happening. And then where a lot of evil and a lot of bad things have happened. And it just entities itself. And like, like um, they say like ghosts. Some places, are, it's not a ghost. It's just the bad energy. It's in there, like the grudge. It's just such bad energy made its own entity, just like this ridge could have, and making people kill themselves. Just like the sadness, it made its own entity there in, you know, the forest. Just like, you know, remember, you guys, remember the never-ending story, guys? The sadness. Don't let the sadness get you. Remember, the, that's like one of the, it killed you when you were a kid. You see that, that's, you, you, the, the, uh, the, the horse going there and he's dying because he, if you let the sadness get you, you suck into the, into the quick, uh, the, the mud and you die. So remember, maybe that's what it is. Maybe this stuff is more than what we think. Maybe evil is just, it takes its own form. And just like sadness, it takes its own form or aggression takes its own form. Like when you see rioting and stuff, maybe there's something behind this thing. Like you get so much people hate and mad and aggression comes and it turns in people to do something crazy. Maybe I'm thinking of a new thing that no one ever thought about. And think about this, guys. Maybe when you have a lot of people around each other that hate each other and aggression, things happen. It just, you get, it makes you do it. Maybe it's not really, it's just, it forms this energy. Like the moon, people say they do crazy stuff with the moon. Well, maybe th energies do change us. Maybe it changes our minds in a way where we freak out and snap and you'll see all this crazy stuff happen. Maybe all that's what it, this is about. If you think about frequencies and stuff that happened in Bermuda Triangle, people lose their planes, crash. But think about this, guys. Maybe all this is just energy turns into something real. Bad, good, negative. If you see things good happen, enough good energy, things will happen. Bad energy, bad things will happen. Maybe that's something we need to start thinking about. The energy that's around us. When you have a lot of negative energy, negative things happen. Bad things keep on happening. So maybe we control our own destiny sometimes. And maybe with some of the stuff that happens, so many people have done so many bad things, it overtakes you with bad energy. But like ghosts, if you go look and, you, and you'll get like this feel of hatred or sickness, maybe it's just such evil or, or such aggression where you can't even, we don't know how to deal with it yet. We don't know how to deal with it. We can't, we're not used to it. And it makes us sick, literally can kill you. So th that's a new thing I wanted to talk to. Maybe I, I don't know. I'm, I might be blabbling on, but I thought about this. Maybe this energy is just there. And over time, so many bad things have happened. And, and it's just, when you go there, bad things happen. You'll see weird things. It's weird thing. Maybe creatures and stuff like that, bad things are attracted to bad things. They're attracted to that area because there's so much negativity there. Or so much sadness. So think about that, guys. Leave in your comments what you think. Tell me what you guys think. I love hearing you guys uh, all the time. Just let us know. There you go, James. It, it really boils down to what that other dimension, what that other realm is. When you talk about negativity, you talk about evil, 
What does that make you think of? Makes you think of hell. What if that that other realm, that other dimension, that other plane of reality, where all these spirits are, the afterlife, what if that is some kind of combination of what we think of as purgatory and what we think of as hell? Because a lot of the stuff that people think about hell today is not actually biblical. A lot of that comes from from Dante, from Dante's Inferno. The whole idea of demons with big horns walking around with pitchforks, poking you and stabbing you and everything, is that's not biblical. When Jesus talked about hell, he talked about darkness. He talked about fire. He talked about sadness. Wailing is what he said. Gnashing of teeth. Despair. What if this other realm where people go when they die, if they're not saved, if you're saved, you're going up to heaven. But if you're not saved, where do you go? What most people think of burning forever, they're thinking of the lake of fire at the end of the Battle of Armageddon during the judgments when you get cast into the lake of fire. That's what you're thinking of when you think of the burning forever thing. But what is hell? Is it possible that a lot of these spirits, these ghosts, these other things actually come from there? Is that what that other dimension is? Is that hell? Because, like I said, what we think of as hell today is not biblical. That's not what the Bible says about hell. It's very interesting to think about. So if that is the case, then these hot spots are spots where the barrier between our world and hell is a lot thinner. Very interesting. I don't know how much weight that has yet. I haven't really thought about it a great deal. It just came to my head as old boy was talking. But at the very least, maybe what what we have on the other side of that veil is what we think of as purgatory. Maybe hell and the lake of fire have been kind of interchanged in the popular mythology that, that people have today. Maybe it's not two separate places. Maybe the lake of fire is where you end up when you get judged at the judgment after the tribulation period and the battle of Armageddon and all that happened, where they have the great throne judgment. Then you get thrown into the lake of fire. But where are you before that? During today, until that time, where are you if you're dead? Well, if you are saved, then you're going to heaven. But if you're not saved, where are you? You're not in the lake of fire until you're thrown there after you're judged. That does not take place until the great throne judgments after the battle of Armageddon. So that is what we would call purgatory, I guess, now is where you're just kind of hanging out and waiting to be judged. And the Bible talks about darkness, wailing, gnashing of teeth, immense sorrow, suffering, all before the lake of fire. So maybe this other dimension, this other realm, this other place is a place of torment. And maybe in these spots where the veil is the thinnest, that energy, those emotions, of sorrow and torment and hopelessness bleed through. Maybe you absorb that as a human being. You pick that up the way empaths can pick up feelings of other people and their traumatic experiences. Maybe we all have that ability. We just don't know how to harness it. And maybe the amount of that negative energy is so much that it just takes you over. 
and you feel like there is no hope and you jump off the ledge or in the case of the suicide forest, you hang yourself or whatever. Also, very interesting theory. I will have to look into that more because when we're talking things like that, I want to make sure that I'm right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get to work on that. And within the next couple weeks or a month or whatever, I will put on the YouTube channel a special episode. We'll either do it as an episode of staring or I'll do it independently on the channel about hell and about the lake of fire. I'm going to go through and I'm going to state all of the biblical differences between the two. And I'm going to get to the bottom of this and see how that relates and what the afterlife is biblically. And so I'll bring that to you on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. If you're not already a subscriber, that's a great reason to go subscribe. But unfortunately, that is about all the time we have for this episode. So I'm going to throw it back over to Old Boy and get his final little sum up and his shout outs. Go ahead, brother. Thank you, brother. I hope you enjoyed that sh uh, the show. I hope you guys check us out on Parax Radio every Sunday nights, 9 uh, Pacific. 12 Eastern, so technically I think it would be Monday morning in the morning if you're in the East Coast. Um, I thank you guys. Uh, let us know what you think. Like I said, leave comments. If you guys want any uh, merchandise, I'll tell you where to go. Shirts, covert masks, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I want to give a shout out to Ed, Ed Reyes and his books. And uh, he's, he's making a book for me right now. It's called In His Name. You guys check it out. We're bringing it out finally. It's another version of it. He's a really good writer. Awesome guy. Check him out if you can. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, happy Halloween, guys. It's Halloween this week. I hope you guys are safe with your kids. You know, be careful because of what's all going on in the world. Plus the wedding, you know, just so you guys know, I'm getting married on Halloween. We'll record it. And you guys can all watch it. So check that out also. So I hope you guys have a great night, misfits, sugar lady, monster lovers, and demon hunters. And have a great night and happy Halloween. And be careful and be safe. Blessed be. Have a good night. Yeah, as old boy mentioned, he's getting married on Halloween. And the plan is that they are going to film it. And then get me the footage. And then I'm going to put that up on the channel so that everybody can come and watch it if you're interested in seeing it if you want to watch it's going to be cool because it's like a halloween wedding so there'll be costumes and everything i'm sure so hopefully that all goes without a hitch we'll see you never know when you're talking about us because <laughs> things kind of go haywire with us sometimes but hopefully it'll all work out um the youtube channel is youtube.com slash james hershey jr that's where every episode of staring into the abyss is that's where every episode of our show, uh, Tales from the Abyss, where we actually go out and do investigations and help families and all that kind of stuff. That's where all of the paranormal news episodes are. I do a show also called Paranormal News, where I take articles and I go through them and do commentary on them. It's a lot like staring, just a shorter version of it, if that makes sense. Um, I also do video game stuff there. There's all kinds of fun stuff on that channel to check out and to enjoy. 100% free, so please come check it out. The merchandise store is teespring.com slash stores slash staring into the abyss. That's T-E-E-S-P-R-I-N-G dot com slash stores slash staring into the abyss. That's where all the merch is. There's shirts, there's masks, there's uh, hoodies, there's posters, there's pillows, there's blankets. There's just all kinds of stuff. There's a bunch of different designs. You have the staring logo with the eye. You have all kinds of different. Uh, staring designs, you have all kinds of different horror designs, there's all kinds of cool stuff there. Uh, so go check it out. If you want to support the show, that's a great way to do so. I just want to say thank you guys for all your support. Thank you for hanging out with us for so many years now. I mean, it's crazy to think when we started this, we were a couple guys that just like to talk about spooky stuff, you know? I mean, we had experience in the field and, and I'm a horror author and, and all that kind of stuff, but the idea for staring wasn't to be some radio show that was heard in like 40 some countries or whatever around the world. It was 
the idea was just to hang out and to talk about what we love, these scary things that we like to, to, to do. And somehow it exploded into what it is, which is amazing. We really enjoy and love doing this, so we're not going away anytime soon. So thank you guys for your support. It means the world. And as old boy said, happy Halloween, everyone. Until I speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.